Uh, Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the, the first meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab for spring 2023. Uh, today, we have guest speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Herman from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Uh, he and I have been collaborating for many years on the um, CATS project, Cybersecurity Assessment Tools, and he's here today to describe our most recent paper validating a concept inventory called the CCA, which we developed. This paper, by the way, um, will be presented at the ACM SIGC conference in Toronto in March, uh, where it won an award for um, best paper of its section. Um, before we get started, I wanna remind everybody that uh, our next application deadline for SFS scholarship for service Scholarships is February 15th. It's a great deal for students who want to work for government in a cybersecurity. Uh, the award is for uh, US citizens and lawful permanent residents um, who have at uh, least junior standing at the time the award begins. Um, in return for a generous scholarship, uh, the recipients are required to work for government for the same period of time following graduation. Uh, the, the scholarship includes full tuition and a generous stipend, um, different amounts for undergraduates and graduates. If you're interested in more information, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, here is Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Herman. I am muted. I think. Hi. Can you hear me now? Uh, and can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Hi. So, uh, my name is Jeffrey Herman. Thank you, Alan, again. Um, and this work has been, there's been a number of different co contributors to this. Uh, some former grad students of mine, Seth Polson, current graduate students, Chan Huang, and then all the people you know at UMBC, Alan, Linda, Anderson Travis and Akshita, an undergraduate, and then also Peter Peterson from uh, University of Minnesota Duluth uh, have all been contributing to this. And so I'm going to go a little bit broader than our paper from the 60 paper, but just talk a little bit about kind of the ideas and how do we, why and how we develop uh, cost inventories and curriculum assessments. And, um, and yes, so that's where we're going to go. So I'm pretty sure I don't need to convince all of you about this general need, but, you know, we look at everything from like last pass that like, I'm thinking about that because I still need to find my new password manager since their data breach and um, so many other companies where it's just like cybersecurity is becoming so much more important for our increasingly digital world. And so, uh, yeah, like that, but the, particularly that part about the workforce, though, we really want to be making sure that we have students who are ready to make contributions and um, understand the nuances of the challenges that we're facing in terms of creating security. And so that is uh, the driving, a, a driving motivation for this project. And that's why organizations like the National Science Foundation and the uh, Department of Defense are investing money. And this is like realizing if we don't invest in workforce development, we we won't ever actually solve this problem. So uh, to get there, um, we, we want to make sure that we're doing is making evidence based decisions about how we educate the workforce. And so, th this slide shows some pictures about kind of historically the way that a lot of uh, medieval uh, doctors and scholars used to think about the way that the human system, human body worked. And so they noticed that there's lots of these different fluids in the human body. And they're like, oh, okay, uh, so you are healthy if your four fluids, your four, uh, called the four humors, are like are in balance. But if you get these things get out of balance, that's going to make you have these weird diseases or have weird uh, personalities dispositions that we don't like that aren't good for society. And so they would like practice the art of bleeding because if you were had too much blood, you were considered sanguine and. And so we needed to get some blood out of you so your humors would get back into balance. And so like there was a theory, like there was a coherent theory behind a lot of that medicine, but now we know it's like, well, it doesn't really hold up under scrutiny. Um, 
And the way that we often teach, I think, aligns with this. We have some of these coherent theories that really kind of like explain to us how teaching works and what we think should work, what things that we should make better. Um, and so like a different area of my research is focused on like things like motivation and that we often think like you have to give points, you have to give carrots and sticks to get students motivated to learn. And it turns out that pretty much by offering rewards and carrots and points and sticks that we actually decrease learning. Um, and that that's just because of the way that the human mind works. It's like, well, I did it for the carrot. I didn't do it for the actual learning. And so the brain is like, oh, I got a carrot, yay. And whatever I did to get that carrot was not important. And so there's like all these really weird things about human psychology and the uh, things that we think would be very effective that just aren't. And um, and so this is one reason why we want to develop assessment tools um, that help us measure whether the changes we're making are actually going to be effective. And so we'll talk about this more at the end of the talk again is like we want to see like like a lot of cybersecurity instructors that we've talked to really think things like capture the flag activities or these simulation based pedagogies, which really try to engage students in cybersecurity tasks will help students learn cybersecurity. That seems totally reasonable. I willing to buy that argument, but we don't know it. And so something like a curriculum assessment would help us determine if those types of pedagogies or those types of curriculums really are actually effective in a way that we kind of would think they are based on our existing mental models of the way the world works. So um, some of the challenges of creating a good assessment is that we don't want to just do it just, just to measure our own like pedagogy, but we want to do this for research. We want other faculty to be able to use this. We want to be able to marshal like the broader scientific community around this idea. And so we need some accepted measures for that. And so this is where this idea of, um, of reliability and validity come in and this idea that we want lots of people to use it. So like, so for example, lots of people poke fun at the US system of measurements because it's not broadly accepted. Like people use metric everywhere else, right? That metric is generally seen as the better measure and science does metric. And so part of a good measuring system is that it has to have um, acceptance because it doesn't do you any good to do science. And it actually can be harmful as we've seen with some like the lunar landings and whatnot that if you start switching your measurements, you may actually start muddying what you actually want to have happen. Um, and then we have this idea of validity and reliability. So where validity is that we all agree that this is actually what we want to measure. So the scientific community at large says, yes, this seems like it's measuring what we want it to measure. Um, and so like a good example of this is something like body mass index right now is under a lot of scrutiny, and a lot of fire, is it an actually good measure of health? And what are its strengths? What are its limitations? When should we use it? When should we not use it? Um, and that's a huge topic of argument um, in, in the health sciences. And so that's similar to this idea of validity in educational assessment. Is this measuring what we want it to measure? And then reliability is this idea is like, I can take a ruler, like the one on the screen and say like, I, like if I give it to 15 different people, we will all come up with basically exactly the same measurement. Someone might be like, say like, oh, it's, 1.1 millimeter centimeters and one person might say it's oh 1.2 but for the most part we're no one's coming in and saying like oh this is a five centimeter object that multiple people doing the same measurement are going to get basically the same measurement and so those are some desirable uh, attributes of any measurement and especially with educational assessment that we want to use for research uh so the uh, the cybersecurity concept inventory that we developed and the curriculum assessment that we as the main focus of this topic or this uh, presentation is our concept inventories. And so this was an idea that was popularized by the force concept inventory in uh, physics and early mechanics courses. And so like on the right is an example picture of like uh, kinematic motion. And so like the, the scenario, it gives students a scenario of saying like, hey, pretend there's a rocket floating in space, floating exactly horizontally according to this frame of reference. And at time P, it turns on its thrusters. What will be the trajectory of this rocket when after, after time P when the thrusters turn on? 
And so hopefully what students should know is that if there's a constant, if these thrusters are turned on at constant force, that the velocity in the y direction should gradually increase. And you should see something kind of like uh, E, where it'll start off slowly moving in the, the, the y direction and then accelerate up in that direction. It won't be B because it won't lose any horizontal momentum and all this other stuff. So the idea here is that without any calculations, and with just some like careful analysis of what's important in the scenario, we can get at some core understanding, students' core understanding of concepts, and um, and if the distractors and the questions are designed well, they'll actually be very informative about what students are thinking and how they learn. So this, and so a common question that we get, uh, like I get, like pushback is like, wait, the multiple choice is terrible. It's like yeah, there's a lot of multiple choice tests, bad multiple choice tests out there. It's just also like there's a lot of bad, bad diets out there. Uh, there's a lot like, but that doesn't mean that good healthy eating it can't be good for you. We just need to follow good procedures and think and follow scientific evidence as best as we can to construct good diets, right? And so um, you can create a good multiple choice test, and we'll talk a little bit about how we do that. Um, but yes. There are there are very good reasons to have a visceral reaction against multiple choice tests because a lot of them are poorly written. Um, so, uh, so what the the concept of inventories ended up doing, which was kind of the motivation for why we want to build these for cybersecurity, is they provided that scientific basis that really has pushed this idea of active learning as being a more effective way of teaching. And um, there's been some enormous meta reviews that have basically shown like yes, this is consistently been the case, regardless of what measure we use, but constant inventories provide one really easy way to do, like, not easy, but broadly agreed upon way to do this. Um, and one reason we like concepts in particular is that concepts are more easily transferred. Um, so like if a student learns how to solve a problem with specific numbers or specific procedures, they can get locked into that specific problem format. But if they really understand the, for the concept of trajectory motion, like in the previous example, they can transfer that to lots of different problems and solve a wider range of con problems. And so that's why we really care about concepts. Um, but there's also very easily gradable, multiple choice is nice, right? Um, and that we have really good uh, what's called psychometrics, and that's going to be the kind of last part of this talk, standards of evidence from statistics that say, are the questions that we generated actually giving us the information we want um, related to student knowledge? Um, so, as I mentioned before, we, like, we are developing both this, we've developed both the cybersecurity concept inventory, which is an assessment aimed at the, a first course in cybersecurity. And the cybersecurity curriculum assessment, which is. More aimed at students who are have finished an entire curriculum getting ready to enter the workforce and, and is really intended to measure are students ready. To really engage in the actual work of creating secure systems. Um, and so the way we go about developing both of these assessments, we follow the same development procedure. So I'll be talking kind of interchangeably about both for a little bit, and then I'll zero in on the curriculum assessment at the end. Is that we started off with a Delphi process, and uh, we'll talk as a, a strategic survey method, and we use expert review as part of that. And so the Delphi process is where we get a panel of cybersecurity experts in this case who each kind of propose a set of topics that they think have to be included on the cybersecurity curriculum or curriculum assessment or inventory. And we limit them to 10 because we really want to focus on what is the core. The, the breadth of cybersecurity or any domain is always growing. So it's really want these experts to focus on what are is this the smallest subset that you think a student needs to demonstrate a competency in the field, because that we can actually then build from. Um, and so then we take those responses, we collate them, we like everyone, you know, people might say similar things. And so we want to make sure that they all kind of work together. Like we synthesize similar responses together and come up with a condensed list of maybe like 40, 50 topics from a panel of uh, 20 experts or so. Um, once we have those responses, we send those out to the experts to say like, how important how difficult is this topic? And we also added the idea of timely or timelessness 
is this a topic that you foresee being important to cybersecurity forever? Or is this something that's just like, it's really important now because blockchain is hot. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and so like, it might be really important for the next five years, but it might not be important 10 years from now if technology changes. Um, and so we really wanted to get at some of those, like what is the core of the discipline and the core of the discipline that we see going forward. Um, and so they would, the experts would rate it on a scale from one to 10, things like that. This topic is too trivial to be included on, an, on a limited assessment, or this is absolutely essential. Um, and uh, so that's an example of what they would do in that rating process. Um, and then what we would do is we'd uh, aggregate uh, the experts' responses and say, and then send out the like the, the means and the standard deviations on the ratings, and basically saying, okay, here is the general consensus. Does that consensus change your mind, or like does it strengthen your opinion, weaken your opinion? Um, and if you deviate from the mean, make an argument. So giving more voice to the outliers is an important strategy here to basically say because sometimes someone likes like yeah that's that's important right now but it won't be important in five years because here's what's coming down the pike and um that that deviation is really important because sometimes you really see that changing the, the consensus to be like oh actually you're right yeah it feels really important now but it's not core and um and so uh giving voice to the outliers uh away from the mean to see if if, does that do they have are there compelling arguments against including an, a topic on the concept of inventory? And then um, we send it out again for one more re-rating with those arguments in place and see is there still strong consensus around different topics? Um, and so this is one way to kind of make sure that like we're only including really the core of the discipline. Um, and this is that the things we include are considered important by a broad range of experts. And I forgot to mention this, but the experts came from like industry, they came from like NSA, they came from government uh, and academia. So we tried to have a good representation of cybersecurity experts. Okay, so um, from that process, what we identified was that the, um, for both the curriculum concept of inventory and the curriculum assessment, there were five really core topics that the experts thought needed to be on these assessments. One is the ability to identify vulnerabilities and failures, the ability to identify attacks against the confidentiality, integrity, availability, triad, and authentication, the ability to devise a defense, the ability to identify security goals and identify potential targets and attackers. So that's um, what our takeaway is. And you notice it's like, it's very non-technology specific ultimately. Um, and so again, we hope this is helps make this an, more of an evergreen assessment that doesn't require knowledge of specific technologies at specific times as much. Okay, so once we identify what should be included on the assessment, according to external, uh, a panel of reviewers, um, we then want to understand, okay, we want to get to a multiple choice question. So what are reasonable and plausible distractors or wrong answers for those multiple choices that would actually get students to pick them that would reflect real student knowledge and would help us to really gauge where some of the weaknesses of students are. So to do that, uh, we conduct a series of open-ended interviews where we're asking students to answer questions about cybersecurity. And then we use the results of those interviews to draft the questions. So to be a little bit more specific about this process, uh, what we do is, for example, give an open-ended question like this, where a user, Mike O'Brien, registered a new account for an online shopping site. He was required to provide his username, address, first and last name, and a password. Immediately after Mike submitted his request, you, this, to the, this is what we're giving to the student who's being interviewed, as a security engineer, observe a database input error message in the logs. And what we want them then to answer are questions like, what are potential security problems suggested by this error? How would you defend against them? And uh, we would record those student interviews. Um, we would transcribe them. And um, oh, I forgot to, I should have added Julia's name. Julia's uh, was a postdoc on the project at the very beginning. She's since graduated or left and moved on to a faculty position. Um, so Julia, former postdoc, and Travis did a lot of the analysis on this, just being like, okay, how are students thinking about this and what types of common problems are students having in engaging with these types of scenarios um, that we are asking the students about. 
So um, the common themes are things like this, where there's like conflation of similar but related but different topics such as threats and risks that students aren't able to keep these uh, different concepts as distinct as we would like to see them be able to do. Um, that students quickly and readily overgeneralize the power or usefulness of different um, security techniques or problems. And so like there's this pervasive idea among lots and lots and lots of the interviewees that, well, as long as you encrypt it, everything is fine. Yay. Um, and so they would be like, well, like pretty much their solution to every problem was we'll add encryption. Well, it's like that doesn't actually solve every type of problem, right? And so um, that was a common uh, challenge that students they don't under, like they understand that encryption is valuable, but not for what purposes. Um, similarly, there is a bias um, towards uh, cyber solutions over physical solutions. Is is one example of these the way that we saw bias coming into this and so like if you have the choice between a firewall and an air gap the students will choose the firewall because firewalls sound awesome um and not really thinking that there's similar solutions for the same problem and that they have like that the physical solution may actually be the better solution for some of these situations um on the, as well the students also tend to be overly trusting of users and insiders um, in, in organizations, they don't, they tend to think of the adversary as some other person, uh, rather than being part, someone who's part of your system. Um, and then they also tend to have very reductionistic ideas about, or beliefs about what adversaries would actually want to do. So adversaries only want to steal stuff that they don't consider things such as denial of service attacks or other, um, uh, those types of um, broader types of malicious attacks, they only think about like, oh, I want to steal information. Like there's like they wouldn't consider something like voter suppression to be a threat because it wouldn't be something that would come to mind. And so these are like some of the types of uh, challenges that we saw. And so we take these misconceptions and these ideas and try to infuse them into the way that we write students incorrect answers to these problems. So we bring this back and so like we have like the so we'll give the student the same prompt and the so this one's from the con cybersecurity constant inventory just showing this one because the prompt is very short um so you see like we can give them the same scenario we give them a difference uh we then choose one piece of the puzzle that we thought was interesting and so it's like oh choose the best defense to protect against possible security problems suggested by this error and so it's kind of building on the questions that we ask the students in the interviews but then we um, um, uh, include answer choices that reflect things from the interviews. And so like things like answer D, choice D is like, oh, encrypt and authenticate all messages between the client and the server. Um, and is that really gonna solve this problem? Uh, I mean, it's not a bad idea, but is it gonna def def defend against this particular attack? Not so much. Um, and so these are uh, um, some of the examples of things that we want the students to be able to think about and the ways that we infuse some of those themes into the way we construct the uh, wrong choices. So similarly here, we um, this is an actual item from the uh, cybersecurity, cybersecurity curriculum assessment, which is asking about local area networks. And, and in this particular situation, there's a selector box that disconnects an accounting LAN on the accounting server of a company from the email server of that same company. And, and that basically it stops a, an employee from being able to access the accounting server from home. They can access their email server, uh, but they can't, they can't access. So this is, uh, so that's the goal. We want students to choose C, um, but one of the big things that where this again kind of reflects some of the student mis misconceptions is that they are unlikely to choose C because they are overly trusting of their own employees. <laughs> that like, wait, why would I need to prevent my employees from accessing the accounting server, right? Like they, they should be able to do that. I should be able to trust them. Um, and so these types of questions are again, uh, trying to do this. So one thing you'll notice about like kind of the level. So one major difference between the curriculum uh, constant inventory is the constant inventory is very vague. There's not like it's 
it's high level. It's not very technology specific. There's not necessarily clear schematics of scenario. Like the scenario is less detailed and less technically deep. Whereas the curriculum assessment questions are more technically in, engaging and require an understanding of things like local area networks to a degree and uh, the types of defenses you might want to design for that activity. So, um, so what we, so after we design all these scenarios and stems and questions, we construct an entire assessment of about 25 questions. And we send it back off to that panel of experts that we use for the Delphi process and say, do the questions that we've created match what you expect? Like, do, are these like good questions that should be included? Like, is the wording clear? Are the answer choices compelling? Um, do you agree with us on what the correct answer is? Like, stuff like that. Cause like with a lot of these questions, like it's like, what's the best defense or like what design does this best prevent? It's like, well, maybe prevent lots of different activities, but what's best or what's better is always challenging with cybersecurity. And so, um, so we sent this back out to the, our panel of experts to make sure like, okay, do you agree that these questions are really getting at these core concepts and um, the core skills and are the questions correct? And so, so for example, in this, for the CCA, what we, the feedback from the experts was that pretty much every expert unanimously agreed that every question should be included. Um, there's only one expert for like three of the questions where they said like, mm, I don't like this question. So, like, uh, and when those uh, experts said they didn't like it, usually it was some wording or some nuance to the question that they didn't like. And so, you know, with further dialogue, we were able to identify, okay, this is the part of the question you didn't like. We can reword that, we can edit it to try to address the concerns of the experts. So for, by and large, all, like we had pretty strong consensus among the experts that every question was strong and, um, for all the questions, no more than one expert got any one question wrong on their own. And so, again, pretty strong consensus among the experts that, okay, indeed, uh, the, the correct answers are the correct answers. Um, and again, usually, if someone got something wrong, it was usually because of an assumption that was unstated in the question, and we, we could go back and then fix that based on their feedback. Okay, so that's that's how we kind of like that's the establishment of like, okay, here is a thing that we want to measure. We want to make sure that it is broadly accepted and that the community is generally is saying like, yes, this, me this is measuring what we want to measure. And so that addresses the acceptability and the validity concerns. Um, and, but what it doesn't address is, is the assessment going to be giving us, uh, um, useful information about the test takers. And this is the field of psychometrics, which says, okay, is there, is there statistical evidence to support the claims that you want to make? And so if we wanna make the claim that a student who does well on the curriculum assessment is ready to go and be a cybersecurity worker, is that, does that bear out? And do we have like, is, so this gets into the question of reliability, um, and as well as some other questions related to information and difficulty, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So with this, what you wanna do is administer the prototypes of your assessment to a large number of students, perform some psychometric analysis, and if needed, you re-administer with a larger sample until you have enough statistical evidence to support your claims. Sorry, I just forgot that I have some people coming to work on my house. I'm gonna go close my doors. <laughs> Okay, um, they just showed up. All right, so with psychometric analysis, there are usually uh, two primary frameworks that people use to analyze uh, assessment tools. One's called classical test theory. Another is called item response theory. They share a lot of similarities in terms of what things they measure and how they approach the stuff. Um, so I'll kind of lump it a little bit together, but if you're curious about to look this up in the literature, these are the two mean approaches that people use that you can like Google and find more information about it later if you want. But broadly speaking, they both kind of engage with this idea of reliability. So is that score repeatable? Difficulty, how hard is each question um, for the population you want to measure? Discrimination um, is this concept of do students of lower and higher skill levels perform differently? And can we detect that reliably with each question in the assessment tool? 
Um, and then uh, item response theory also has this idea of information. So it's like, if you get a score on a student, how well can you predict exactly how good that student is? Um, and so it, uh, item response theory uses logistical modeling or logistic modeling to get a clearer description of a student's ability level than like what than just the numeric score. And so it's we'll, we'll talk a little bit how that works in just a moment. So uh, so like from a classical test theory perspective, this is data from the uh, concept of inventory just to give you a sense of how that works. And then I'll show you um, uh, from the curriculum assessment as well is what you would do is like you would administer a version of the test at smaller scale and just be like, okay, am, are we getting something that we like? And so with this one, there's this, I, there's a measurement. So we did some pilot testing on the uh, constant inventory with 142 students and we measured Cronbox Alpha. So Cronbox Alpha is a measurement of reliability. And it basically goes on a scale from negative one to one to kind of think of it like a correlation metric. So like basically, uh, uh, other second metrics will be bad at me, but I'm going to use this analogy because I think it's helpful to understand, like develop an intuition. It's like basically how correlated, if a student took this test multiple times, how well correlated would their tests, their scores be on each subsequent assessment uh, take? Um, and so you want it to be somewhat correlate, like you don't want it perfectly correlated because then usually that means it's trivial. Um, the test is trivial and you're not measuring interesting things. But you don't want it to be low either. So typically, we like to see uh, alpha coefficients in the 0.8-ish range. A little bit higher, a little bit lower is fine. Um, that's what we're aiming for. And you can see, like, the Cronbox alpha was generally pretty strong. Um, and then, like, the mean score in classical test theory is kind of what we intuitively think about as difficulty. It's like, okay, if it's if the average score is 8.6 out of 25. That's pretty low. That's a 33% score. That's kind of how classical test theory thinks about difficulty. Um, and that's that's fine. And it is like instructive, I think, for understanding like, oh, this test is reasonably hard. Um, and so that was one thing like we paid attention to is like, oh, the, the constant inventory was harder than we would have liked it to be. We don't really want the score to be around 33%. We'd really like it to be closer to 50%. Um, and we also identified questions that might not be working. And so uh, we, we made some revisions to the constant inventory, sent it back out to a bigger population of students and saw like, yes, indeed. Okay, great. We, imp we made the test a little bit easier and we improved the, like, so this is kind of like your baseline, easy statistics to run, um, that give you a, a quick sense of is the general the, is the assessment as a whole, giving you some of the properties you would like to, ha to have. And so you don't want ceiling effects. You don't want floor effects. So you don't want the distribution to be too far to the left or right, um, things like that. Um, uh, so we did the same type of analysis and work with the uh, cost curriculum assessment as we did with the cost inventory. And um, here are some relevant statistics that we can talk about. So, um, so the curriculum assessment is on the, in the left column. The cost inventory that we developed is in the second column, and then there's three other. Uh, concept inventories that I've included here, mainly because this is we, we're presenting this to the, as uh, Alan said earlier, to the ACM 6C conference, where uh, there are other concept inventories that have been developed in that community. And so we wanted to situate it for them to say, like, hey, here's how this assessment compares to other assessments in the discipline. So there's the digital logic concept inventory, which is DLCI, the secondary concept uh, CS1 assessment, um, SCS1. And the, so that's for like a intro programming class and the basic data structures inventory, which is for a data structures class. And so like kind of from this perspective, what you can see is that the CCA has very, very good reliability, especially compared to some of the other assess inventories. It's just like give you a sense of like this is relative to kind of peer uh, assessment tools that have been developed. It's in very good standing in terms of its reliability. Um, so that's kind of just one thing to give you a sense of like, well, 0.83, is that good? I don't know, like you can take my word on it, but it is, yeah, so that's, so it's it's hard to get it up to that 0.8 level, as you can see, as some of the other assessments have had difficulties reaching that level of reliability. Um, and then the, the remaining, the remaining um, statistics are statistics that come from the item response theory. So difficulty 
uh, a difficulty of zero indicates that a student of mean ability will have about a 50% chance of getting a question right. So let me kind of, I'll, I'll illustrate it with these slides here. Um, so let me use the laser pointer. Okay. So like, so what item response theory does is it models students ability, like students ability to solve a question correctly using a logistic curve. And so basically it's saying like, okay, for this question with difficulty zero and discrimination one, that's the solid line. Basically a student with zero, like at mean ability will have a 50% chance of getting a question right. And as their ability level drops off, basically, so this is like two standard deviations below the mean, they'll be down to about a 10% chance of getting a question right. And a student two standard deviations above the means will have about a 90% chance of getting a question right. Um, and so that's that's like a logistic curve of modeling student ability versus uh, the percentage chance of getting a question right. So if we increase the discrimination to like two, what you'll notice here is that the like the probability drops off a lot faster. So you can see like basically now a student with two standard deviations below the mean is now basically not going to get that question right versus it's a student of two standard deviations with me will basically get that question right all the time. Um, and so discrimination is a good thing in this case. Um, we want higher discrimination for our questions so that we can pinpoint what students know and what they don't know and ideally eliminate guessing and randomness from students' responses as much as possible. The other parameter, difficulty, is like, so you can see like this, like uh, the, the dotted curve and the solid curve have basically the same shape but it's just shifted to the left or to the right. And so a item with like negative 0.5 difficulty is easier. Um, so a student with ability below the mean, it still has a 50% chance of getting a question right. So that's what these statistics mean um, and how to interpret them um, here. So, uh, so what you can see is like a, an assessment tool like the CCI actually has very hard questions and very easy questions. Um, so questions that require, you know, the being two standard deviations of the mean and questions that give it, like are targeted at students who are two standard deviations below the mean. Um, and so it's very much, it's good for that like intro level course. And that's what we want to see. Um, in contrast, the CCA is a little bit more skewed towards being more difficult. And that's some like, Given that we want this to be for graduate level, like students who are graduating and getting ready to go to the workforce, we are expecting a higher level of knowledge and a higher level of ability. So having a little bit more difficulty is is okay. It's maybe still uh, I would maybe argue it's a teensy bit too high, but that's kind of like how you can look at what's going on with this assessment. That it is a harder assessment um, than the CCI, which makes total sense given the different target audiences for the assessments. But it's not so crazy hard. Like so, like this is this this is the SCS one, which is designed for an intro programming class, where like you have some questions. You have to be five standard deviations above the mean to have a fifty percent chance of answering your question right. That's probably too hard. Like that's that's a really high bar to getting a question right. Um, and so it is like it's a hard assessment, but not insanely hard um, versus what's been published out there in the literature. Um, and then. The discrimination again, like, so I'd be like the main thing is that you want discriminations that are all positive. So that's that's good. And you want the numbers to be as high as possible. Um, and so you can see, like, like, generally speaking, it's, uh, it's, it's all positive and um, the discriminations are ranging from 0.4 to 2. And so generally speaking, the discrimination is pretty strong for most of the questions. Um, okay, so that's so overall, like, statistically, its profile is pretty strong for the CCA. And um, and then from that the, those parameters, what we can calculate is basically take the derivative of these logistic curves, and we can create item information curves. Um, and so basically, they tell you how how well can you estimate a student's ability based on this question. And so like so a, a question with higher discrimination, it's like if they, a student gets this question right, we this is like a probability distribution of where we think that student's true ability lies, and we can then. The more information we have, the more closely we can pinpoint that student's ability um, to, on that curve. And so uh, the reason why, sorry, let me, one more point. And what's 
better, why we like item information curves over like the logistic curves at the end of the day is that we can add item information curves to get an overall information curve for the assessment that then lets us be like, okay, how close can we measure students for the entire assessment? Whereas uh, logistic curves can't be added together. Okay, um, so just to give you a quick profile of what the assessment tool looks like. Um, so here you can see like question 13 is the insanely hard question at like three uh, standard deviations about the mean. And it also has the question with the least discrimination in part because it is so hard. Um, so you can see it's kind of got the shallowest curve. And so by basically like, so what you would do with this analysis is say like, okay, maybe we should take out question 13 and maybe replace it with a different question or consider revising it or whatever it is. This question probably does need to be repaired. Uh, but the rest of the questions have that shape that we like, where it's like they are quickly, you know, increasing um, right around that 50% range. And so they're giving us more targeted information about the individual students. Um, and so overall, all the individual questions are performing pretty well um, as a group. And um, yeah. Uh, so, and then, like, like I said earlier, you can take the derivative of all these curves, add them all up together to get the item information curve for the entire assessment. And, um, and so here, this uh, dotted, the, the dashed teal line is the concept curriculum assessments information curve. And you see it is, it is skewing a little bit more difficult uh, that we really get a lot more information about students who are one to two standard deviations above the mean. Um, but, it, and it's also a much taller and uh, peak than pretty much every other inventory, including the CCI that's out there. So it's a very, very informative test for those high performing students, which again, is, there are some nice things about that, particularly if you're looking for like, trying to say like, how, what, which, which, which programs or curriculums are really preparing students to really enter the workforce and do well. That's, that's a, that's not a bad um, characteristic for the assessment tool. Um, and so overall, we're pretty pleased um, with the quality of the assessment, given all those considerations. And I think it reflects like there are there's some small tweaks that we can make, like, you know, replacing question 13, maybe with an easier question to give us more information about uh, weaker students. Uh, but that is uh, overall, it's we are we are pretty happy with that outcome. So, again, um, so some of the future work that we are planning to undergo and um, if we have the energy is to do some more item level analysis of the CCA. So thinking about like, so if we can take a question like, uh, this one here, which answers are the students choosing? What does that tell us about what those students believe? Is there some correlations between questions, which, which distractors seem to be the most compelling and can we find out more? And so that like, so we can do individual, uh, uh, item analysis with that. Then um, the other thing that we are doing right now is that we want to start testing some of these assessment tools. But this one will be primarily using the CCI, excuse me, because at the military academies or particularly at the, U, uh, the Naval Academy, all students are required to take a cybersecurity course. And so our goal and hope is to run some large scale studies about changing the teaching methods of faculty at the Naval Academy to see if that really does actually, like using some simulation-based pedagogies, using things that capture the flag activities and other types of um, simulations will actually help students learn more um, than the traditional kind of like lecturing-based teaching that they have been experiencing. So um, yeah, so that's uh, where we're going and happy to take questions and, I think we have plenty of time for those. I have a quick question. Yeah. So earlier you um, pointed out that, you know, amongst amongst novices, there's a common misconception that the adversary isn't part of your system. Do you find that that is unique to students 
um because we are sort of doing a lot of protocol analysis at umbc and i would say like one of the core misconceptions about protocol security also is related to this actually yeah i, I have no reason to believe it's it's isolated to students any more than any other misconception i think it's it is a i i would guess that there is um um a fundamental human bias towards that so there's this idea of um, in group versus out group bias that we tend to like, like we build communities because that's how we feel safe. Um, that's kind of a like, evolu that's an evolutionary advantage for us is to live in groups and live in communities and um, that we like, I, th I think we see that with political polarization, right? It's like, if you get information from someone within your network, you trust them, even if they are liars, <laughs> um, because they that you identify in some way with them. Whereas if the, sa the same information came from someone like, so someone who identifies as a Republican hears something from a Democrat, they're more likely to be suspicious of that information. And so I think there is some core fundamental human bias that way um, in the way that we process information. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I, I don't really think there's a reason to I think that's isolated to students. Um, but is a is it a bias that we have to try to help students overcome in the way that they design uh, their systems and protocols? Okay, thank you. You've Next. developed uh, several concept inventories now. Uh, based on that experience, what are some of the lessons you've learned, uh, some of the words of wisdom you'd like to pass on to other people? They're all. Well, I mean, so I think one thing which you've mentioned several times, Alan, is this takes a lot more work than you would typically think. Um, and precisely because it is like, and you get better as you go. I think you you develop, you get some intuitions about how these things work and there really is value to following methodology um, to this. Because I, I think you, we could create a passable assessment tool um, just from our intuitions, but I think being able to ground it in like, in the community, like, so, yeah. So uh, how, I, like, so I think both with cybersecurity and digital logic, which I also worked on, there is, it's really hard to find consensus. No matter which topic you pick, no, what, no matter what subset of topics you pick, someone's gonna be upset that you didn't include their pet favorite topic. Um, and so that's that's always really challenge. And so having some some, basis to be able to say like, yes, we totally understand why you're saying that. And here's why it's not there. And being able to like helps people be like, oh, okay, I guess you're right. Like, like having information from a Delphi study can help you defend against critiques um, and help people to come around. And then um, the, uh, and I think, Having information from these interviews helps explain, like, I mean, what's really encouraging to me is like, I wasn't part of the question development team. So Alan and Ennis and others all helped write these questions, but I can still see some of like, like, yes, this actually, like the questions that seem to be doing really well actually seem to really align with what we saw in the interviews. And so I think letting that inform the way you write your questions is very helpful because there's so many things that like, I know what my students do wrong, but I don't know why um, as a teacher. And so, doing those interviews and really looking at and studying student responses helps you uncover like, oh, that's where they're messing up. Um, yeah, I think I like methods. I think they help us achieve more than we could on our own. <laughs> yeah, so okay, as one more thought, like, so Ennis, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of research done by, um, a research group called the Cultural Cognition Lab that really does a lot of this work on like, uh, so it's like, I think it's Dan Kahan, um, among other researchers, if you're just curious about how other other fields, so they, like he's particularly interested in politics and how that shapes how, like, he predict, like he's done some really interesting studies about how scientists like are bad at interpret their data when it comes to political issues. Um, and, and like, so like scientists will interpret the same data differently if it's about climate change versus if it's about like the cost of hair dryers, the same data set. <laughs> um, 
you know, it's like stuff like that, where it's very interesting how our our politics and beliefs and who we think the information is coming from shapes how we interpret statistics. Um, so there's some fun stuff there if you're interested. And that sounds really interesting. What is the what is the working group called? Uh, it's called the Cultural Cognition Lab. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking of methods, is there a new research on um, proposing improved or different methods for generating concept inventories? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there's this whole field of psych, <clears throat> psychometrics, and there's a lot of work out there that is. I, how would I put it? It's like the high energy physics models of um, assessment. It could be very useful, um, but it's also really hard to achieve. Um, and so, a lot of like, so like, I hope this analogy is okay, but like, majority of the time, Newtonian mechanics is just fine. It'll help you solve the vast majority of problems. Um, and so, um, the kind of where the methodology is going much more so is really trying to get at super fine grained um, like knowledge. And so there's this, something called cognitive diagnostic assessment models, which is, oh my gosh, really hard to do. Um, so you have to basically like, so where you're seeing this come up is in places like studying how people learn something like fractions. Um, and so, to like the sheer number of ways that you can understand and learn about fractions is is staggering. Um, it's like it's way more complicated than you would think it is. Because like like on one hand, it's like well, you're just dividing the top number by the bottom number. It's like yeah, that's that's one like that's 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 what a fraction is. But that's not how people reason about and solve problems with fractions. And so um, there's like so many different techniques and uh, tricks that people use to solve like problems with fractions um, that have nothing to do with division. Um, so, you know, just like simple heuristics, like I see, oh, I see two fifths and two ninths. Five is bigger than, or five is smaller than nine. So two fifths is bigger, right? Like I don't have to actually, I didn't do any division there. I just was doing number comparisons. And so, um, so part of what diagnostic assessment does is it's look, so you're doing like all these careful interviews, seeing, documenting all the different ways that people solve these problems. And you like give basic statistical weightings to each skill needed to solve each problem. And then you can create a, a profile of what skills a person likely has or doesn't have to solve the range of problems in a domain. Um, and that's, that's, the the nature of that is like you're like so again kind of like the difference like difference between Newtonian and uh, uh, quantum mechanics is like with quantum mechanics you are very concerned about like very small details of a very small phenomenon and you narrowly have this narrow focus of like very small just fractions it's not math it's not arithmetic it's fractions um, and uh, whereas like like with something with the cybersecurity curriculum assessment we want that bigger macro view and so. A lot of the work is less relevant um, to the types of questions. So, if you really want to understand, like, how do students reason about like confidentiality or something, maybe you could do like a really deep dive in that um, with those techniques. But you wouldn't want to do that with the type of assessments that we're working with. By the way, um, one of the ongoing research projects at UMBC that we're working on this term with um, student Kaiawanthia uh, is we're going to administer the CCI and a five-factor personality test to subjects and then see if there's correlations between the performance on those two uh, instruments. Yeah. To, to see, like, it, are there some inherent psychological factors that are associated with people who do well in cybersecurity. I'd be curious, do you have agreeableness as one of the personality metrics? It, it is, yes. Okay, yeah. I would expect that to be anti-correlated. <laughs> um, conscientiousness maybe, 
correlated. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. That's yeah, it'll be interesting. When is that wrapping up again? Well, it's really just starting. Um, okay. we're, we're going to collect data this semester. Um, one of the hardest tasks that we've encountered in these sort of studies is actually recruiting subjects. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. I don't know if you have any words of wisdom about um, how one can collect subjects more easily. Persistence and personal connection. <laughs> I think that's all you got. <laughs> um, I think especially the more narrow you get into the field, like fewer people go into cybersecurity, so you've got a smaller pool, unfortunately. Are there any more questions? Well, thank you very much. Um, Jeffrey, and um, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, the next two talks will be um, Andrea uh, will talk about the results of the SFS research study from January in which students examined the security of cyber physical systems in the new UMBC building ILSB. And then two weeks after that, Ennis will talk about his protocol analysis work uh, on uh, FIDO and, and, and cryptographic binding. So with that, um, uh, we're done for today and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you everybody. Thank you.